Hey guys, I have a couple of Android apps you're not going to want to install, and AI is being used to detect fires and to detect video being generated by AI. With all the AI craze, it's only fair that we have AI tools to fight against the AI. Yeah, I know, lots of AI, and Android apps you shouldn't install. Let's talk about it. Today we are facing an unprecedented array of data breaches, hacking attempts, and surges in digital crime. Why is there such a widespread amount and how little is noticed in our everyday lives? Malware, dark sites, brute forcing, zero days, script kitties, and nation state hackers are all on the rise. Learn more about the threats we face and gain a bit more knowledge than yesterday. Hey everyone, another episode of Exploit Brokers is coming to you now. Hey guys, so this is Lauda with another episode of Exploit Brokers. I want to thank you for coming back, and if this is the first time, I want to thank you for clicking. Uh, if you guys could do me a big favor because it helps the channel grow immensely. If you are on YouTube, please hit that subscribe, like button, and hit the bell notification. If you're on a Spotify or Apple podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, please give a follow and a review. And as well, if you are a podcast, please check out the YouTube channel, Exploit Brokers. We are looking to bring in some AI and some hacking content, tutorials and stuff like that. In addition to the shows that we normally do, talking about different articles and giving some more insights from a computer science software engineer perspective. With that said, let's go on to the first one. All right. In an article by Latest Hacking News, Latest Capra Rat Android Spyware Campaign Targets Gamers TikTokers. So... To give you a bit of context with this, we are specifically talking about Android spyware, not iOS spyware, as you know, said by the title. According to a recent post from Sentinel Labs, their researchers observed a new Capra Rat Android spyware campaign aimed at specific user groups, including TikTokers and gamers. There is four specific Android apps that they're targeting or that they're discussing here, um, which is Crazy Game or specifically com.maeps. Cry GMS dot TKTOLS. It's an app impersonating the legit crazy games dot com platform. Sexy videos, which is a com dot nobra dot cry GMS dot TKTOLS, which is an app redirecting to YouTube videos. And TikToks, not TikTok, but TikToks, which is a com dot MAEPS dot VDOSA dot tktols which is an app mimicking tiktok video platform aimed at targeting tiktok users and lastly is weapons which is com dot maeps dot vdosa dot tktols and this app is the clone of a of a channel called forget forgot this is an app which is a clone of a youtube channel called forgotten weapons it's pretty much a youtube with the same name now, these apps are built with these names specifically to get people to download them, whether it's by trying to use something that they might be trying to get, like crazy games or weapons, or trying to get something that, you know, people shouldn't be clicking on, like sexy videos, or trying to get a well-known app misclick, like TikToks, right? If someone's trying to go to TikTok and they don't know any better, well, maybe TikToks comes up as one of the lists, or maybe they're sent a link or something and weapons and crazy games well you could be searching for that as well and i'll just say test test to the last one <laughs> um so there is essentially sne uh, sneaky behavior that gets caught on with this right so you install the app and suddenly you're given tons of permission requests according to the article there's stuff from giving access to sms contacts gps location read and write access to storage camera, audio recording, screen recording, call a history, permission to make calls and manage network state. That is a lot of videos for something that would be TikToks, a video uh, viewing platform or weapons if you're just watching weapon videos and stuff like that. Now, the malware before wasn't as sophisticated from what I'm able to tell, but lately they've actually bumped it up and now they're using something called a web view feature. So web view feature from what I'm understanding and from a development standpoint, would essentially be for you to pull up a web browser within the app. A lot of web browsers will do this for signups or for specific features or functionality. Here, they seem to be using it because they're trying to redirect, right? So for TikToks, um, I would imagine, I don't know that this is what they're doing for sure, but based off the article and what I'm understanding, is they are going to YouTube and pulling TikTok videos in aims to make it look like a TikTok clone. 
And the reason they're using uh, YouTube from what I would guess is because TikTok tends to have a lot of their stuff behind sign-in walls and things like that. You can't really access the TikTok videos or at least more than one or two without being signed in. So Capra Rat, and I'm going back to the article, Capra Rat is a known Android spower belonging to the suspected Pakistan state actor group Transparent Tribe, aka Apt36, Operation C Major. This group has been known since 2016 and has, and has run numerous malicious campaigns against users, particularly targeting Indian victims. So if you have any friends that live in India, send this over to them. Um, the biggest recommendation I have for you guys is if you install anything, please be sure to install from the official app store. Um, don't install apps that look fishy. And if you get an app that has like a thousand permissions, be very mindful of the kind of permissions you give to your app. If you have a note taking app, if you have a video app, it shouldn't need to, you know, listen to SMS, see your contacts, read and write storage to access, unless maybe you can save videos. You know, you gotta, not all of the permissions seem obvious. Like the permission to make calls, your video viewing app shouldn't be able to make a call. It's gonna be on a case by case basis, depending what the app is trying to do. In an article by Live Science, new AI algorithm flags deepfakes with 98% accuracy, better than any other tool out there right now. Recent research into methods for spotting AI-generated video look for specific markers not found in standard digital images. I know that's a mouthful, but let's kind of dive into the article and then we can talk about it. So with the release of artificial intelligence video generation products like Sora and Luma, we're on the verge of a flood of AI-generated video content, and policymakers, public figures, and software engineers are already warning about a deluge of deep fakes. Now, it seems that AI itself might be our best defense against AI fakery after an algorithm has identified telltale markers of AI videos with over 98% accuracy. So, the reason 98 is kind of a significant number here is when you try to do any kind of training on video, or trying to do any kind of AI training at all, the higher the accuracy, the more difficult it is. And there's always a concern for something called overfitting. So say you have, okay, let me actually step back for a second. The way that you do training is you have a data set of, generally depending whether you're talking supervised or unsupervised, but for the sake of this, you have a set of training data that you are getting, and then you run that through an AI model different weights and stuff are distributed and pretty much you're teaching the AI, you know, this image is this, or this video is this because the video is ultimately just a bunch of just stitched together. Right. And once you train it, you can then get a piece of data you're actually interested in and you run it through and then it'll tell you. Now, the problem with this is high accuracy is usually good, but you can also run into problems like overfitting where it does really good for your data. Let's say, you know, it gets 99% on your training data, but then you run it through a hundred images and it gets half of them wrong with real data. That's overfitting. Now that's why 98% is high because if you're keeping 98% with real data outside of your training, not only have you generated a valid model that is not overfit to data and it's actually useful, but 98% is better than what I figure most people are able to determine and it's better than most of the tools currently out there by several points. Now, several points may not seem significant, but when you're running into extremely large numbers of videos, every point matters, right? So if you're talking a thousand videos, then 1% is 10 videos. So right there, you're talking 20 videos would be mischaracterized here versus if something is say 90, you're talking a hundred videos. So 20 versus 100, that's a lot more videos that are going to be flagged incorrectly. Let's keep going and then we'll kind of circle back and kind of fill out a bit more information here. Until now, forensic detection programs have been affected against edited videos by simply treating them as a series of images and applying the same detection process, Stam added. But with AI generated video, there is no evidence of image manipulation frame to frame. So for a detection program to be effective, it will need to be able to identify new traces left behind by the way generative AI programs construct their videos. All this to say, in the previous iteration of fake videos, there would be kind of 
telltale signs, the way that frames are edited and put together because they're still run through programs like Premiere or, you know, After Effects or different videos to get different effects, different programs. And that creates artifacts that you can pick up if you were to examine frame to frame. Now, AI generated video doesn't have that because it's all being generated by the AI. It is in itself the editor and the creator of the set video. The new tool the research project is unleashing on deepfakes called MISLNet evolved from years of data derived from detecting fake images and video with tools that spot changes made to digital videos or images. Because again, digital video is just a bunch of images put together. These may include the addition of movement of pixels between frames, manipulation of the speed of the clip, or the removal of frame. Such tools work because a, camera's, a digital camera's algorithmic processing creates relationships between pixel color values. Those relationships between values are very different in user-generated or images edited with apps like Photoshop. Again, there's discrepancies with the way that there's pixels between frames, or the speed of a clip, or the removal of frames where you're expecting something to exist in this frame, it's not there. And that can happen because when you're doing video editing or you're doing Photoshop, you're purposefully manipulating images. Now, but because AI generated videos aren't produced by a camera capturing a real scene or image, they don't contain those telltale disparities between pixel values. The Drexel Teams tools include M MISLNet, learn using a method called constrained neural networks which can differentiate between normal and unusual values at the sub-pixel level of images or video clips, rather than searching for the common indicators of image ma manipulation like those mentioned above. Now, the significance that they're able to see outside of just a pixel, they can see below a pixel, which I'm assuming they're probably talking about maybe splitting pixel data. It goes into a very technical paper, which I haven't had a chance to go through, but Suffice it to say that the tools that you're using pre-AI video generated and post-AI video generated are almost night and day difference in the technique. Not to say one's better or one's worse, it's just different tools for different jobs. Now, MISL outperformed seven other fake AI video detector systems correctly identifying AI generated videos 98.3% of the time, outclassing the other systems that scored at least 93%. Now, that goes back to the significance of it, because that's a 5.3 improvement. A 5.3 improvement over 100 videos is five, is five videos. Over 1,000 is 50. That becomes more critical. Now, would it be awesome if it was 99? Yeah, but to get the higher amounts, it takes extremely good algorithms that can train AI. And what I mean by that is AI is nothing more than essentially linear algebra and applied that it's a very oversimplification view of it, but it comes down to creating a mathematical representation in the form of weights and neural, neural like networks, depending on which way you're approaching this, and then trying to get video data into a mathematical value that can be analyzed. I know that sounds like mumbo jumbo, but I promise you there is a lot of truth and a lot of oversimplification to what I'm saying. Suffice it to say, the fact that we have a new AI algorithm that can figure out if something is video made by an AI or a video is made by AI, that is phenomenal. In the world where everything is digital versus, you know, whether you're talking about Instagram or TikTok or just Facebook or any other video platform, including YouTube, what someone can say or someone is caught doing on a video, good or bad, is pretty much either elevating or down. So AI trained cameras beat the naked eye at spotting first signs of wildfires. This is really cool. I mean, when, when I read this, I was kind of really geeking out. If you think about it from a logistical standpoint, you have thousands of acres sometimes in the US where there's virtually nobody. Um, there's even horror games that are, that are kind of revolved around the idea of the fire watch towers, which are just towers really meant to have someone out there looking for fires. So if we could use AI to help us with that, right? That's more resources we can throw at this without necessarily having to have people in the middle of nowhere or in very remote locations with, you know, very minimal resources. And we can monitor 
pretty much 24 7 and you don't have to worry about fatigue or endangering people's lives because if a fire does get started it could quickly you know surround them there's different concerns so a computer and a robot will always be more expendable than a human life just the name of the game so let's go ahead and jump into the article on june 17th early in the fire season in washington state a blaze ignited acres of undeveloped land in mason county where people are dispersed amongst the olympic peninsula dense forest and jagged peaks no one called 911 to report the burn the local fire department had no idea the jurisdiction was on fire but within hours the fire was out burning just under 20 acres in total the covert eyes of two ai trained cameras on nearby vantage points relayed a warning to dispatch centers far afield the cameras developed by artificial intelligence startup Pano ai are able to detect plumes of smoke the earliest signs of a wildfire in the making so they're using video processing which is what a lot of ais are doing right now uh you know what we just talked about the ai detection that's grabbing video or image data converting it uh one of the popular ways is using something like a convi convi convolutional neural network or a cnn but they're getting video data and they're trying to detect smoke a lot of these ais when they're really specialized ais are very powerful we i say we but as a generality humans interested in agi which is uh, artificial general intelligence you know thinking sci-fi level one ai to rule them all if you will but this is a very specialized ai that can run on what i figure is going to be significantly cheaper hardware than you know like a forty thousand dollar gpu and the fact that we can get these kinds of AI trained, it just kind of shows the ingenuity of some engineers out there. As the article continues, after confirming the blaze, Payno AI called Washington's Department of Natural Resources, DNR, which sent firefighters to the site. Coordinates from the camera guided them to within 100 feet of the ignition source, which is really impressive. 100 feet is virtually nothing if we're talking about thousands of acres. The fact that the computer can figure out where it was based off its position and stuff like that it just kind of goes to show how really cool processing can go. You're thinking, you know, lots of math and some cool video processing. Now, the fires would have gone a lot bigger before it attracted any kind of attention, said Thomas Kyle Millward, DNR's wildfire communications manager. At And speed matters. The faster you get a fire, he added, the smaller you can keep it. Big fires only get bigger, right? It's kind of a game of momentum. I live in Texas, so I've seen a couple of big fires show up here. I know California has a really bad fire problem, um, and I don't know if other parts of the states have worse or equal. Not sure. But whenever you see a wildfire, it's always bad because it just keeps eating and eating more. If the conditions are right, it can spread extremely fast. If you can keep damage to a minimum, that's going to be good in almost every single case from a financial perspective, a lives perspective, an infrastructure perspective, say no lives are lost, but if a thousand acres are burnt, that's agricultural or parks or something that gets lost. Now, continuing, DNR launched a pilot program with Payno AI last year, placing 21 cameras at sites around Washington where wildfire risk is high. The chances of a person reporting it are lower based on historical data and models. DNR has extended the contract through 2029. The camera cost around $45,000 each for the for a total annual price tag of $948,000 after the pilot. Washington DNR is not only benefiting from extra eyes. Payno AI has cameras in 12 states and, provin and provinces across the US, Canada, and Australia covering 16 million acres, according to an April press release. Other customers, other customers include utility companies XL Energy and Austin Energy private landowners, and government fire agencies. The San Francisco-based company raised $45 million from investors as of March 2023 and employs 45 people. So, if you look at the leverage of AI, the, this is what I just found really cool, right? If they're covering 16 million acres with 45 people, that's that's an insane leverage, right? You're talking like just the a scale. I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words here. 16 million acres by 45 people leveraging computers, that's kind of the cool part of, of technology, right? There's a quote that I like where any significantly advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I believe it's Clark who said that. I could be completely wrong and misattributing that. But the quote has a lot of grounding reality, right? There's, if you were to tell people 20 years ago, AI is going to be 
cool enough where it can detect fires and we're going to be able to use it as a way to stop major fires from growing. I mean, 20 years ago, our AI was night and day difference of the kind of AI we've seen evolve in the past couple of years. Um, even when I took um, AI coursework in my undergraduate, which was, I was taking that around late 2017, it was not as cool as it was now. You saw the early parts of like conv convolutional neural networks and stuff like that, but with the launch of GPT and several other deep neural network stuff, it's just blown up overnight, like amazingly fast paced. And I'm curious to see where it's going to go. Now, if I continue, in Washington, Paino AI has picked up several ignitions this summer before they were visible on satellite imagery, which I mean, that's pretty cool. Matthew Deere, DNR's lead fire meteorologist, said Paino AI detected a now contained fire near Yakima in central Washington before he could see it and the current technology is allowing him to monitor other blazes firefighters are struggling to contain. Currently, 55 large fires are burning in Washington and Oregon, according to Northwest Coordination Center. A fire near Chilean in central Washington that began in early June has already consumed over 33,000 acres. With fire season far from over, Deere said it's difficult to compare this year to previous ones, but he predicts but he predicts the next month or two will be very challenging. I mean, th this is one of the really cool use cases of AI, and I don't imagine this is going to be one of the last ones. There's going to be even more AI use cases, and I'm not just talking about GPT wrappers that we're seeing pop up. I'm talking about really cool apps and really cool uses of technology that can essentially become extensions of our abilities, whether to improve quality of life, save lives, um, improve processing, or improve just different hard problems to reach because that's what engineering is all about it's going to be really cool to see where this comes from or where this goes but guys this has been louder with another episode of exploit brokers i want to thank you for tuning in again please subscribe hit that bell and hit the like and i will see you in the next one